We are back with another episode of Matchup Zone. We are here today joined by Nick Lorenzen from the Horizon Roundtable, but that's not the only place Nick is uh, is from. Nick, tell the people um, about some of the cool cool groups you write for. So it all started a couple years ago. I had a UMBC account on Instagram. So when they ended up beating Virginia, it blew up. That opened some doors. I started writing for Mid-Major Madness, SB Nation site. Now I'm at the University of South Carolina, so I write for their student newspaper. But a lot of my stuff has to do with uh, South Carolina and Baltimore basketball. Okay, nice, nice. We like that. Um, the mid-major madness is a big one. Uh, that's really cool. We're a big fan. Well, uh, a lot of NKU fans are big fans of mid-major madness. It's uh, you know we're kind of it's it, it's nice to have a publication that actually pays attention to what you're doing <laughs> as opposed to, you know, what all the big dogs are doing. And that's, I love, I've always personally loved like just kind of that us versus the world mentality that those guys take on over there. So cool stuff. And um, you cover Wright state now for the horizon round table. How did that come about? Like you're not a right state guy. Where did that yeah, come I'm not from? a right state guy at all. I actually, I was planning on going to Dayton and then, Last minute, I got a deal from South Carolina, so I ended up going to South Carolina, but I just continued with it this year. Why not? And they're a good team. So. Yeah, yeah. well, it's, e yeah, it's easy to cover someone like Wright State as opposed to, you know, we have some guys in the league that cover. Uh, well, Detroit Mercy is actually good. I was going to give Carrick some crap because he has to cover them every year, but they're actually good this year. Um, but no, yeah, you're, you're, uh, you're really doing us a huge favor. I actually, my plan last year was – you know, Wright State's our biggest rival. I figure if anyone, if we can't find someone from there to cover them and anyone should cover them, it should be me. Cause like, I, I mean, I watch most their, I, I watch a lot of their games anyway. And so I, my goal last year was to try to cover them. And that didn't work out trying to build up this brand. And uh, it's, you know, it was just, there was too much of a demand for, for content on the North Report side. But glad to have someone on board to cover. Probably the best team in the league. I mean, Wright State, they've uh, – what's their overall record? How many games have they lost overall? They lost one out of conference to Marshall, so – Okay, so four losses are, overall. 17-4. Right? and four. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, they're that's right, that's right. And they're number 17, speaking of 17, they're number 17 in the mid-major madness of their top 25 this this week. Um, yeah, they, they've been great. Uh, they've lost three conference games, like I, I sort of mentioned there. One of them was, I would say one of them was probably a little convincing, um, but we can get some details on that maybe from you, the mm -hmm. Oakland game. Um, the other two, though, were on buzzer beaters. I, I remember uh, the Youngstown State one was weird because, first of all, you know, they lost on a on Nas Bohannon having the ball uh, from, like, at the three-point line, like, making a play, isolated one-on-one, -on -one, and Grant Basile got, like, lost on the rotation but it looked like he was almost expecting some help side on the baseline and it, he just got up too high and nobody was there to cover the baseline block guy and Bohannon hit him and just powered it up for a layup end of game um, kind of like a freak miscommunication and then the, the other game they lost was a buzzer beater to uh, Cleveland State Torrey Patton hit that I think it was like an elbow shot something like that and uh, then Wright State turns right around after those two losses and beats the living hell out of those teams 
uh, I think dropped like, I think what it was like a 40 point win in both games on the flip side, something like that. So that's where we are now. Um, Nick, I, we've been kind of going back and forth on this with Wright State. Um, how good is this team? I mean, obviously the Horizon League ha- ha- feels a certain way about them or, you know, the formula says a certain thing, but is this team the best team in the league? Like, t- tell us, tell, validate this for us. I think they are. I think by far they're the best team. The strange thing about them is they have depth, but it's a strange kind of depth because they only have uh, like six guys that they run usually. And Jalen Hall comes off the bench this weekend. He had 19 points. He shot a perfect four for four from three off the bench. And I mean, that Oakland game, just everything went wrong. And those two losses on the Friday night nationally televised games, they like, they were in it the whole game. It was just terrible defense on that last play. And, Nagy ended up taking the blame for it. That first game, he's like, I can't sleep. I couldn't sleep the next – or that night. It was just that terrible. Well, it's obviously I mean, a miscommunication. I mean, I went back and watched it three or four times on that exact – are you talking about the Youngstown State game, right? Both of them. But, oh, okay. So, on the Youngstown State one specifically, I did not watch the Cleveland State one live. I went back and just saw the play. But um, the Youngstown State one, I saw – like, Grant Basile, whether it was his fault or not – he definitely was expecting help side on the baseline. Like he, it almost seemed like his job was like, wait until about five seconds left and then leave your guy come up and be there for when Nas Bohannon is going to drive. Cause he's not going to shoot a three to end the game, right? He's they're expecting him to drive. So Grant's role was to come up and stop that drive. And he was almost expecting a rotation on the baseline, but like, yeah, I, it just seemed like a miscommunication. Yeah, that first one, yeah, that first one was a miscommunication on defense. The second one was too, but Nagy just refused to call a timeout. So really? he said he was real mad based mm-hmm. on his assistant said he that for him to do it. But even if you shut down Loud and Love for a game, Grant is gonna end up going off and vice versa. And I mean, we have guards that can shoot. So I mean, if you shut them down, you pretty much have you're gonna have four guys on them. There's nothing else yeah. you can really do. Yeah, and that was kind of what it was last year, too. I mean, Wright State's always been a team that's gone, you know, six, seven, eight maximum if you're in foul trouble deep. Um, and and everyone, it's like, it's really weird. Like you said, they have depth, but not necessarily depth in numbers, more like depth in skill. Like when someone goes to the bench, it's next man up and they can fill right in. To your point, you have an all-league player who's probably going to be player of the year, loud and love and if he's off don't worry grant basili can come in and score 25 and you know it was like that last year like uh they the guards could shoot so last year at at right state and ku went out there and the our guards played horrible defense did not pressure the ball the ball gets to the middle and then it gets rotated back out for a three right state shot i think 12 of 22 against us in the first from three in the first game at at their place beat us by 32 the next game at home we played them a a lot slower. We were a lot more aggressive, gave their guards a lot more problems. Um, Loud and love was the only player to go off. He had like, I think 18 or 20 points. And I think 16 of the first 19 were his. So obviously he went off at the beginning, came to the bench to get a, to get a, a breath and then never was able to find a groove again. And we were able to like, it was interesting. Like we almost said, you know what, if Loudon eats, Loudon eats, we're going to stop everyone else though. And like that second game, we posed a greater threat. So it, yeah, it sounds like more of the same from Wright State this uh, this year. Um, let me ask you this. So I just asked you if they're the best in the league. You obviously agree with that. What do you think the, like, what do you think is going on with the league? Like, I don't understand. I know we talked about the formula, but like, why do they refuse you know, when you have a team that's tied with another team and we talked about this, they've played each other twice. They're one and one. So like, okay, fine. But Wright state loses the first game by two on a buzzer beater and then comes back and beats them by 40. So like, just by that alone, that should be the tiebreaker, right? I mean, it, I'm a junkie for these type of things. I love doing tiebreakers and all that. This season is just gonna be too difficult. So I'm staying away from it, but I mean, right. they have like these four things listed out, but the four things don't have like, this is the first important. So this is going to happen second and all that. 
I mean, well, so if you look at the four things though, I think by process, they do look like they're ranked. You would mm-hmm. hope, but you just yeah. don't know what the weights are. Like, mm-hmm. it's like you have the variables, but like, you don't know what the weights of them are. So like, you don't know what to attribute them. Like you would think that Northern Kentucky would be the three seed right now. They're 10 and six. Oakland's a three seed at nine and nine. That makes absolutely no sense to me at all. And I, I think that they should do like say they both both Cleveland State and Wright State sweep this weekend or win one and one, they should do whoever has the best record against the third seeded team. Like they've always done the down, down, down. Yeah, down. that is how they have always broken the tie. But then it's like it get, then it gets weird because like if you have these problems with tiebreakers even lower, like the problem this year is you don't know where to start with how to seed these teams. Like because there's you know the formula is supposed to be the seeding, right? So it's not like, Hey, here's the standings. And then we're going to have some ties inevitably. So we'll have to do tiebreakers. It's, Hey, here's a formula to calculate seeds for everyone. So it's like Detroit mercy might be third in the league, which they are, or I think they're fourth in the league. I don't know. I can't remember yeah. what their standing yes. is, but they're the sixth seed. And it's just like, and you know that, and that's where it gets confusing for me because to your point on Oakland, they are the three seed right now. Um, even though they're fifth in the standings, right? And yeah. we have a better conference record than them, but they've played more games than us in conference because we had to miss the Detroit Mercy series. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's what's like, I don't know, maybe they're combining everyone that we've played their conference record and like weighting it based off of that. I, I don't know. My whole thing is like, I don't care. It's, I've been trying to tell people like this whole season for me has been an asterisk, right? Like, yeah, I feel you. Yeah every game we get to play is just a net positive in my opinion like there's teams that have shut down their season Detroit Mercy had to skip a month of basketball like I I just I see this as like what do we have to lose this is a gimme like the team that wins it this year is gonna hang a banner and every other team that doesn't win it is gonna put an asterisk next to the year and move on with all their same roster for the most part so I mean the WCC is doing an interesting thing. I saw just before this. They're partnering with Ken Palm. They're doing a like adjusted wins. So St. Mary's right now, they're two and four in the league. They'd be like maybe the sixth seed, but they're all the way up at three, four. So because they beat someone, they beat like someone that. that was good. You think? I guess they've kind of been bad in conference play. But the thing with them is they're St. Mary's, and then they have a name, and they yeah. always end up pulling the games out. So. Interesting. I don't know, maybe the league's doing something like that. Well, I'm all about partnering with Ken Palm. I mean, look, I don't, I can't, you know, Ken Palm metrics have their flaws, obviously. That we talked, we've talked before about the luck, the luck metric they have, where um, it's basically like a catch all. Oh, well, you know, we forgot to calculate for this. So here's luck, right? But um, I mean, I don't know. It's the best analytic out, out there, in my opinion. So I use it. Yeah, no, no doubt, no doubt. We we definitely we uh, we re- reference it to uh, weekly in our power rankings. Chris Chris Hart, my partner in North Report, uses that metric to uh, influence his, his rankings. Um, all right, let me ask you. You kind of touched on it a little bit with you know Wright State, their key players and some of their bench players. But I mean, what is it specifically that makes them so good? I mean, this is a team that has been top or near the top of the league every year for a while now. I don't expect you to go down the history or anything, but tell me a little bit about like this year specifically. It, they're out here just crushing teams in their wins. Average m- margin of victory is like 25 a game, somewhere around that. What is it about the about Wright State that is so relentless that makes them so good in their wins? Like you said, when they force the ball inside and there's people guarding them and they can't get to the basket. They just pass it out. I mean, Nagy's such a good coach. Nagy didn't even want this to be like an offensive season. He's even talking about that this weekend, like how he's not like that. I, I guess, uh, happy with how they're like the way they're going this year. Like they're focusing on offense, but it's obviously working. Yeah. And I mean, they just outscore they gave up 53 points to Milwaukee this weekend on Saturday, but they shot 75% in the second half. So, I mean, they're just matching and doing better than everyone else. 
Do you think a little bit of it is, I mean, this is going to sound really lame and I'm sure that if a player was to, to listen to this, which probably isn't going to happen, but if a player was to listen to this, uh, they'd probably roll their eyes. Do you think any of it has, it ha- is intimidation? Like, I mean, this is like right state, like they are good and they have three players that are probably going to finish first and second team. Um, you know, is, is, do you think any of it has to do with that a little bit? Yeah, they always talk about how they feel like they have a target on their back. You know, they're picked first in the preseason, so teams always come out harder against them. But, I mean, then they will just end up beating them by 30-40. And from, like, January to – I think it was just January, every game but the last two, the wins were by, like, 30-plus. It's just insane. Oh, yeah. No, their, Their lowest win in conference this year is nine. Right. And that's like early on. Uh, I think it was like, uh, who was it? Youngstown or no, no, they crushed Youngstown. I can't remember who it was. What, what was it? It's been Green Bay, but I, these games this yeah. last weekend were really close too. So, oh, that's right. Okay. Okay. So that's going to bring down their, their average margin of victory. Yeah. Milwaukee's weird like that. They don't, I mean, you saw Cleveland state jump all over them and they fought right back into it. So, um, all right. Well, I guess, I guess we'll shift to this. I mean, I, I don't know if this is even going to yield results, but as someone who is an NKU fan and kind of hoping to see us maybe get a win this weekend, um, I'm looking for common themes in their losses, right? They lost to Youngstown State. They lost to Oakland before that by 10. Uh, they lost to Cleveland State. Obviously, we, we mentioned two of those losses were buzzer beaters, but there's a, there's a huge difference between crushing Cleveland state by 40, which they did the next night and losing to them by two. Like you don't just accidentally lose to Cleveland state by two and then go crush them by 40. Right. So there's, it's a basically the, the, the average result is somewhere in the middle. Right. So Cleveland state had to have done something or right state did something very poorly uh, on that Friday, on that Friday night game, same for Youngstown state, same for Oakland. So what, have you noticed is to be a common theme in their losses? I know that two of them were on Friday. One was on Saturday. Uh, You know, I think one was at home, two were on the road. So like those are kind of out the window in my opinion, but is it, they're not crashing the glass hard enough. They're not taking good shots. What is it you're seeing when they do lose? It's just matching tempos and like making adjustments. A lot of their losses, they aren't scoring a lot. Another weird thing I found when looking at all the losses, every single win they've had in conference play, someone has scored 18 plus points. And then all the losses, someone hasn't scored 18. So if you're somehow able to get them to distribute the ball and not let one person dominate per se, like let a loud and love or grandpa slowly go off. I mean, you've got to do that. But I mean, this team's just. I don't know how you do that. That's usually the opposite of what you want to do. Right. It's usually like, hey, if Loudon's going to kill us, Loudon's going to kill us, but just don't leave the shooters. Or, you know, so how do you like when you're, so I mean, yeah. So when you're a team that can't match Loudon Love man for man, right? (laughs) Or else he's just going to put it down your throat. Like, I don't know. What do you do? And we're, you know, I hate to say it, but like Adrian Nelson's one of my favorite players in the league, even if I wasn't an NKU fan, it's easy for me to say, but even if I wasn't an NKU fan, I'd be an Adrian Nelson fan. But like, as much as I love that guy, he got like picked up and set down in another spot last year by Loudon Love. Like literally Loudon Love treated him like, you know, he was a dad putting his son in timeout at, at, at points last year. So he's gotten bigger and stronger this year, but you can't get, he's not three inches bigger and 40 pounds heavier you know they usually got to bring someone else on one of them you can't just play one-on-one with loud and love or grandpa so it's not going to work right and that's always that's been a huge problem for nku is like we're not bad at help side defense especially inside um but we also haven't been in the situation this year where we've had to really throw a lot of help towards adrian nelson like he's been in the situation where first of all there's no other centers in the league that are just like the offense runs through them Right. Loud and love is unique in that Drew McDonald was the same way. The offense by Drew's senior year, 50% of the offense ran through Drew. Um, we, you know, Drew was like a point guard on the block, basically. It was, it was amazing. It was like Tim Duncan, right? It was like amazing to watch. And uh 
I mean, we just haven't, we haven't faced that this year. So it's going to be really hard to decide to figure out like what we're going to do. But to your point, it's like, we have to double team have to, or at least throw a look of double team, even if it's token. And then, but also quickly rotate back out to the shooters. And if right state, like, I just feel like if, even if we get that first rotation, right. And they make an extra pass at some point, someone's going to be found open. <laughs> so that's what really trigger. makes me nervous. Sorry. Yeah. They'll make a quick trigger three, you know? Yeah. It just, oh man. Okay. Well, um, yeah. So aside from like not playing the same, you know, the correct tempo, uh, it, I, to me, it sounds more like um, you're saying that it's more like what right States doing to themselves in these losses rather yeah. than like, there's nothing that stood out that a team has done to them to really give them problems. Like, I guess I was kind of thinking like, have they seen a lot of zone this year? Have you, that you've noticed? I mean, it might not be something that like you've been I looking mean, for. I feel like a lot of it has been zone. A lot of you got the three down low usually, but I, yeah, it's just, if they aren't putting enough points, they aren't going to win. Yeah. That's a, so <laughs> slow. Okay. So what I'm hearing then is potentially slow the game down. Like we want to, we want to make this a, uh, we're not going to win an 80 point shootout. We're going to win a 66 to 64 game is what I'm hearing. Keep them under 70. Okay. Yeah, keep them under 70. All right. Well, that'll be, uh, that'll be a point of emphasis then I'm sure uh, in, in, uh, in a future article this week, hopefully. Um, all right. Well, here's the thing, man. I feel like most of our fans are pretty, pretty caught up on the right state we obviously know who loud and love is he's been the butt of every joke um for 17 years that he's been at right state um you know the and barstool nku accounts all of them they'll like they'll let loud and know how how they feel about him especially when he changes his hairstyle up and stuff like that um we know about we're starting to know a little bit more about grant basili uh his hairstyle also helps with that um, and I think that's, I think, I think most NKU fans have at least heard of Tanner Holden, uh, yeah. un unless they just didn't watch the game at Wright state last year, because he, uh, ate us up. Um, aside from those three though, you said they go about six or seven deep. Tell me about the rest of their, uh, the, you know, the rest of their contributors. I know they have, um, Trey Calvin, Jalen Hall, Tim Finke, um, tell me about like those guys and if there's anyone else that we really kind of need to be, need to be on the lookout for. Well, Trey Calvin, Jalen Hall, they usually flip flop in the starting lineup. They're both every other couple games. So they're both due to put up like 16 to 25 points. Tim Finke is a, he was one of the top recruits out of Illinois, I want to say, and he ended up going to Grand Canyon and he didn't last there long. He, he's another one with a lot of hair. He has a big beard, big uh, fluffy uh, hair. He, oh, that's right. Yep, I've seen pictures of him. <laughs> I mean, out of the six, it, one of these guys is going to end up dropping at least 20 a game. But then when you get deeper, I mean, like Alex Huberks this weekend, he had a big uh, – he had – I think he went two for two on, from three on Friday. Him and James Mann – they're both two players that don't play that much, but Nagy will put them in at times. And they would start on most teams in the league. But the guards, we just have so much depth at guard, and we don't really have to use it. I mean, someone will just end up going off. Uh, sure. Jalen Hall started 0 for 7 on Friday. Let's see what he did on to finish the game. He went 7 for 8 on Sunday, and he was 4 for 4 from 3. He finished – I don't know about the 0 for 7. That's what someone said post game. Post game, they said he went 0 for 7, but he went 4 for 6. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> but I mean, they all of them have to be averaging close to double digit points. Holden has 16. Finky has 10. And he has 6.8 rebounds. And then Hall coming off the Hall's playing starters minutes off the bench. He has 9.6 points per game. So I mean, if you take out one of the guards, another one just comes in and they'll produce for them equal or better. Yeah. Um, 
I'm not going to lie, dude. I'm looking at right states stats right now and it just doesn't it's mind-blowing to me they're at their their first in conference in points per game at 83 and a half uh which is just ridiculous um their first in defensive like defense points allowed or whatever uh at 65.4 they're i mean i could just keep going they're they're first in blocks first in assists first in total rebounds first in defensive rebounds second in offensive rebounds they're first in free throw attempts and free throw makes. However, they're fourth in percentage. On the flip side of that, for some reason, they don't foul people either. They're only giving up uh, 12.7 free throws a game, which is first in conference, by the way. So they're they're not fouling anybody. Um, they are only allowing somehow their free throw defense is good too because teams are only making 8.6 of those per game for a league worst 67.7%. They're first in free throw defense, um, <laughs> which is with no fans, a very interesting stat. Um, I, it, you know, it probably has something to do with the backdrop at Wright State. It's so, I'm sure it's like ridiculously hard to shoot in that huge arena um, with no fans there. But yeah, I mean, they're, they're, this shouldn't surprise anybody either. They're uh, first in two point attempts and two point makes. So they're pounding the ball in the paint. Um, they are middle of the road in um, three pointers, uh, but they're high in percentage. And then they're also first in three point defense. So I, that's like, I, I don't know, man, I'm not trying to be this like super negative person. I, and you know, any NKU fans that watch this are going to hate me, but it's just like, I don't know what to say. Like, we don't have size. I don't know. We're not the greatest three point shooting team. We did, sh we did shoot out, out of the gym against Milwaukee, um, which is nice, but that did not carry over to green Bay. Um, so it's like our form. I, mean, I don't know. I'm going to ask you, Nick, what do you think is the formula for NKU like outside of someone or many players from Wright state, either fouling out or getting hurt for, for us to, to, to pull one out against this team defense you gotta if you're gonna double team on the inside when the ball kicks right back out you gotta make that you gotta go right to the shooter transition defense is another big thing too I feel like they make a good amount of points on the fast break so you got to do that too but defense defense is a key yeah I think one thing I'd like to see, we talked about a little bit about this, me and the guys on our last week's, uh, we do another show called Last Call, kind of like a, you know, bar theme, like we're closing the book on the week kind of thing. Um, and on that show, we discussed our lack of size. And, you know, Adrian Nelson can be our big guy, that's fine. But like, he needs support. And we just thought like, how interesting would it be if we even if it was against Wright State, just to like a what the hell, like it would be really cool to see Hoopman, our seven footer, um, Nelson and David Bam all on the court together. David Bam's our six six eight six nine guy from Czech Republic. I call him uh, I call him Dirk Bam because he's like Dirk Nowitzki. I mean, I'm a huge mm -hmm. Dirk fan. Like I grew up a Mavs fan. So, but um, I, I think it'd be interesting to see that out there offensively. It'd be a struggle i think um but like if we're all about defense and trying to slow the game down and stunting them inside you know i've always said that when the other team has a tank the only way to beat a tank is either with another tank which we don't have or with a really tall wall and you know what i mean like one that the tank can't drive through or over or i guess it can go through but it's going to take time at least um so you know i it'd be interesting to at least see some length out there by NKU, but I have a really bad feeling we're going to try to beat them our way, which is kind of like always been Darren Horn's philosophy. It's why he won't switch away from the zone run, run man. You'll only see the matchup zone out of us. So, all right. Well, I don't know, man. I don't really have any other questions for you. I did get a couple questions on Twitter um, that I want to get to. Uh, they were kind of, jokes but let me uh see if i can pull them up real quick so one guy wasn't too happy about someone making fun of loud and loves hair that oh someone hair. oh did somebody somebody get mad at it oh no you're talking about you're talking about commissioner lane yeah he said can you ask why loudon looked up douche haircuts on google 
and has gotten each of the top five results. <laughs> um, that's a good one. It's a good one. Did someone? What is wrong with you, douche? Recognize douche. Okay. Uh, we, looks like we started a fight on Twitter. But um, I did quote tweet um, this little here. Let me see if I can do this real quick. I did quote tweet um, Kamish Lane. And uh, by the way, he's not an actual Kamish. I'm not sure where the Kamish comes from on his part. But let me see if I can. I think I can share my screen. Um, I ran a, uh, I ran this back at him and said, you know, here are some hairstyles I think that Loudon actually has beat. So you got the Walter White. Not sure if we can see Loudon Love rocking that or not. Um, then you have the, uh, let's see, the, oops, the, the um, Justin Bieber with the dreads. <laughs> so then you got the Justin Timberlake with the frosted tips. And uh, then you got the Boris Johnson. You know, I almost went Trump, but I thought too soon. So I went Boris Johnson instead. I could see um, the Bieber and the, the British Prime Minister. He's British Prime Minister, right? Yeah, yeah. That's yep, Boris, Boris Johnson. Yep. He's a, uh, yeah, he's a loon, as they would say mm -hmm. in Great Britain. But yeah, Bieber, I mean, Loudon Love's right there with Bieber. I actually he looked could, up. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, he's got the cornrows. I actually looked up. Uh, to find this hairstyle, I looked up white boy uh, dreadlocks and I found Bieber. And I was like, <laughs> all right, we're, we're going with that. So, you know, uh, no disrespect to Loud and Love. This, the whole point of this is to say that, like, if he went with any of these, it probably would be worse than what he currently is rocking right now. Yeah, and I, I, hear, I hear he's a great guy, too. Um, mm. Like a really, really, really nice guy. So we don't want to give him too much crap. But, Nick, any, uh, any final thoughts or any any additional remarks you wanted to make um maybe give us an outlook for not just the series but maybe even like the conference tournament too if you want i'm looking forward to this week i'm looking forward to you know the horizon league tournament starts a week before anyone else so we got that next wednesday next thursday it's next thursday i just hope that Wright state doesn't come out and lay another egg in the tournament and someone like in northern kentucky at three or a Youngstown or Detroit makes her way in. Like, I'd love to see them in, but I'd also love to continue covering Wright State through the tournaments. So, yeah. So, they don't lay in. Yeah, I'm with you, man. Well, so, and for NKU too, like, something we're going to have to look out for is, you know, the reason I'm not sweating the, the ranking system too much is because, you know, for someone who would love to see our team win the whole thing. I feel like we're currently in a pretty favorable situation. You know, we have the four seed, so we have a, a one round bye, and then we have to play, uh, you know, it'll be, I think the, well, they, they reseed. So it'll be the, the highest ranking team that wins in the first round. We will play them as, as it stands right now. And then you get through that. If you assume that all top four seeds, which never happens, but if you assume that all top four seeds make it, I, I think actually it did happen last year, but make it to Indy, um, then we we have Cleveland State and like I'm not gonna lie, I, we don't know anything about Oakland, you know, mm. except that they're they are talented, pretty talented. Oh, they, um, they have a good, a solid coach. Yeah, I, Campy Campy is good. He's good. He's a lot of a lot of Cincy or a lot of uh, NKU fans who are also Cincy Bengals fans call Campy Marvin Lewis, but we won't go there. <laughs> um, but but anyway. Uh, I, you know, I don't want to play Oakland. I really don't want to play Wright State. I'll take my chances with Cleveland State. They're probably the best overall team in of those four in terms of like they can beat you with 10 guys and they just play very good team basketball, whereas Wright State does rely on their stars. Um, so if you get one or two of them in foul trouble, you know, there's a lot more variables at play there. But like I don't want anything to do with Wright State. I'll take Cleveland State. We lost to them by 14 in the Friday night game we played where they were dominant from the tip, but then we lost to them uh, the next night by three on a Mar Marquez Warwick missed like rimmed out buzzer beater that could have taken us to another overtime. I think we were already in overtime at that point. Um, so like, I'll take my chances there. I'm not stress stressing too much, but I will say if we lose to Wright state this weekend, unless Youngstown state and, uh, Detroit, I mean, you could, I got to look out for them to sneak up and get a top four. Like if either of those teams go two and oh, we go oh and two. Man, yeah. 
we're going to drop pretty far, I think, and or at least we could. With the one seed never – there's a one seed curse in the Horizon League, but one seed never ends up doing anything. So yeah, maybe the I two think, seed will be good. Yeah, I think uh, – so this guy that used to run a, a account called Valhalla Vanguard, you won't see them a lot this year, but they were around last year. They were kind of like a student fan account, um, similar to Barstool and KU, but they basically would just talk a lot of shit, especially about Wright State. He was responding back to my tweet about the seeding, and he said, I don't want the one seed anyway because something about, I think he said the one seed hasn't advanced to the championship since 2015. I think the last two times was 2015 and 2019. When we, we did it in 2019 or no right state was the one seed in 2019 and we were the two seed and we beat them but the one seed hasn't won it since i think 2015 i think that's or maybe even earlier than that mm -hmm. i don't know it might be earlier than that so it's yeah there is a one seed curse in the in the horizon for sure so we'll see i think yeah. right state's good enough to break that though if they if they I, get two I wins think... this weekend they should jump yeah but, Nick, thanks so much for joining, man. I really appreciate it. Hope uh, I hope you have had a fun season covering probably the best team in the league. Um, mm -hmm. Hoping to see you around for another year or so, uh, but no pressure, no pressure either way. Appreciate, appreciate you, man. it. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, of course. Thank you.